My name is Anthony Reiter. I'm the Assistant Director for Planning and Programs here at Green Thumb, where I oversee our special events, educational programming, garden visioning program, and more. I have the distinct honor of introducing our moderator for our final panel of the day, Gardening in the Age of Climate Change. Shakar Krishnan is the New York City Council Member for District 25, representing Jackson Heights and Elmhurst and Queens, two of the most diverse immigrant communities in the world. He is chair of the Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation. As Parks Chair, he has approached access to parks and expanding green space as a key component of social, racial, and immigrant justice. And he negotiated the highest budget ever for New York City Parks for fiscal year 2023. Let's give a warm welcome and round of gratitude to Councilmember Krishnan and the rest of our panelists. Should be on now. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so nice to see you. Thank you so much, Anthony, for the introduction. Thank you to the Green Thumb Program and the Parks Department for an incredible conference. It's so inspiring to come in here and see, I think someone had told me over 1,200 people have registered for today's conference and that this is the first conference in person since the beginning of the pandemic in 2019. So I have to say right now, being in the middle of uh, the entire budget process where I'm fighting very, very hard, uh, both uh, outside and the internal negotiation rooms for our parks budget and making sure that we get the resources we need for our amazing park system in our city. Um, it is truly inspiring to come into a room like this and be a part of today's conference. Uh, I'm council member Shaker Krishnan. Uh, I represent Jackson Heights and Elmhurst Queens, um, which, uh, and I'm also, the, as, as Anthony said, the chair of the uh, parks committee in our New York city council. And one of the main priorities for me coming from a district that um, I always say is the most diverse immigrant community in the world, have the best food too, I'm biased, but I do think so in Jackson Heights and Elmhurst, um, but also we were the epicenter of the epicenter of the pandemic in the entire country. And most don't know that we actually rank 50 out of 51 council districts when it comes to green space um, in our community. So we have really one park um, in each neighborhood of my district. Um, and because of redistricting starting next January, I'm actually losing more uh, park space. And so coming from a district that has some of the least amount of green space in all of New York City, I know how crucial it is for our public health, for our mental health and well-being, for our climate, and especially that it's an issue, as I, as, as I mentioned before, of racial justice, where whether it's having access to green space for our children and for ourselves, whether it's making sure that we have the proper tree canopy covering our communities so we don't have some neighborhoods like mine or in the South Bronx or North Brooklyn that have some of the highest uh, ground temperatures compared to other neighborhoods in our city. These are, we have to see our green spaces and our parks as, and treat them as the essential public spaces that they are. And we need to support them that way. Um, I was proud on our city council that we had the first ever tree canopy hearing in the history of the council last year. And we just came off our first budget hearing um, just a few weeks ago. And, you, and many of you all I'm sure know too that New Yorkers for Parks and the Playfair Coalition had put out an incredible report about our park system. And you really see the way in which compared to other cities across our country, even though we have the most amount of park land, we actually invest the least of the big cities when it comes to our, our green space. We're nowhere close yet to 1% for our parks budget. Um, and on top of that, the per person dollar investment in our parks in New York City, I think is around $73 a person, whereas San Francisco, Chicago, LA, Washington DC is upwards of 200, 250, sometimes $300 per person on park space. And so you really see the way in which literally compared to every other big city in America, we are so far behind our investments. And as I always say, if we are to make our parks and treat them as the world-class parks that they are, then we need to invest in them in that way. Um, and that's why conferences like these are so important because in our fight to expand green space for every single community, to find new and innovative ways to create green space where none exists, whether it's one of my bills last year in the council that we passed to look at dead ends or um, under overpasses or highway entry and exit ramps to turn those redundant street spaces into green spaces, be them micro parks, community garden, whatever it may be, 
we need to be creative in the way we, we are approaching creating green space and then putting the resources behind it uh, to invest in them. Uh, and that has to be done equally across our city. Neighborhoods like mine don't have the resources for conservancies for our parks or things like that, but we deserve the same, if not more investment than any other park in the city. But we've seen the way in which over time, the public dollars that we've invested in our park system has steadily gone down um, over the last six decades. Um, as the parks have become more and more important for us, they're not a privilege, they're a right, the public investment has gone down dramatically. Um, and yes, we were able to achieve the highest budget for parks last year, but there's so much more work to do to make sure that we're investing in our parks um, in the way that we should be. So I know today we'll be talking really about a crucial aspect of our park system when it comes to our community gardens that play such a central role um, really in two things. One, finding ways to create and preserve much needed green space uh, oftentimes in communities that don't have it, and two, really democratizing that green space. I think community gardens are some of the most amazing experiments in community-led democratic decision-making to care for our green spaces that bring people in together. Um, and it's at a time when we're facing not only fights for our parks, but we're facing so many other pressing issues around our city too. Um, community gardens are a great and effective tool in bringing our communities together. And I know with, a, with the amazing panelists that we have today too, um, these are the conversations that we'll be having and I'm very, very excited um, to moderate it all. So thank you all for joining. Um, I wanna thank our panelists here today, Rachel Garber Cole, um, an artist um, with the publication, The Warmest Years on Record and Oral History, uh, Jackson Gilke, uh, Gilke, La Plaza Cultural, um, Armando Perez, Ray Pang from 462 Halsey Community Farm. Um, these, today's panelists will do an amazing job talking about these issues. Um, and I'm just happy to be a part of that conversation. So we're gonna start um, with an audio clip to set the stage that Rachel's gonna play for us uh, before we get into the discussion. Uh, I'm not gonna play it or uh, Elena will be playing it. Right. Well, it's going to be played one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see, the birds think it belongs to them, and they allow us to come in. They're probably and, right. Yeah, they are, you know, yeah. that's their space and they allow us in. You know, because some days we sit here and they're talking and they're talking to each other and then they sit here with them, no? So I found that two little birds were outside on the sidewalk. You don't know how they got there. So people were, you know, what are we gonna do? So I took off my hat, my cap, and I threw it over, picked up one, brought him back and I put him over here inside that way he won't be in any danger if his mommy comes somebody he kill her no she'll find him and i go back and i get the other and that uh, we be uh so we've rescued uh, uh birds uh we've rescued cats mark and i came here one morning and there was a cat on top of the fence little kid little little green so we took him mark he still live with mark today and that was like Ten years ago, <laughs> uh, and then we rescued another, and then we rescued people in this garden. People that needed something, some type of to fill that void in their life, something they wanted to do and find something gratifying, and this is it. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. Thank you for setting the stage for us too for today's important conversation. Um, and so I wanna start, oh, and one thing I should mention is after we have some questions uh, for our panelists, we'll be taking some questions from the audience too. So I think you'll get a note card soon where you can write your question down. Um, I'll go through them. If there are any in particular you wanna direct at a specific panelist, just make a notation of that too. Um, but without further ado, thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. Um, let's start first with Ray and Jackson telling us a little bit about um, where do you garden? Um, what is the work that you're doing every day? How did you, um, how long have you been a member or a leader for in your garden? How did you get involved in the first place? Maybe we'll start with you, Ray. Uh, yeah, 
thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, I'm Ray Pang and I garden at 462 Halsey Community Farm in uh, bed -Stuy. And uh, I've been a member there for three years. So I would say I'm pretty new, but I've been, I'm in my second year as uh, the compost leader coordinator. And uh, right now we are getting ready for the new season. We've planted spring crops. Uh, we're getting like our rain water collection system set up. And uh, yeah, we are kind of in the throes of reaching out to volunteers and dormant members again. So exciting times. Nice, thank you, Ray. Um, I'm Jackson Gilkey. I am a gardener at La Plaza Culture Hall, which is in um, the East Village of Manhattan on 9th and C. I've been a member there for almost 10 years now, which is crazy. Um, and I've been in a leadership capacity there for about five years. I've been director there for two, going into my third season as director. Um, and yeah, right now we're just yeah coming out of coming into spring. Things are popping up, trying to fix a leak in the pond. It's just another day. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you for the work that you both do too. And looking forward to speaking more about um, the work that you do in your community gardens and the issues that you face there too. Um, Rachel, I thought you gave us all a bit of a background on the project that you're working on. Um, what sparked your interest to, um, and how is it all going now? Sure. Yeah. And I realized when you said I was playing the thing, I could have set the scene and explained what that audio clip was, <laughs> which I will do now. Um, so I'm here because uh, the past two years, I've been partnering with Green Thumb and Brooklyn Community Gardens on um, the Wormest Years on Record, which is an ongoing oral history that I've been doing since 2018. And it collects audio, I collect audio recorded interviews with people about their sensorial, emotional, psychological, and experiential encounters with living in the climate crisis. So um, I, two years ago in 2021, I came to Green Thumb to see if they wanted to partner with me um, on a new round of interviews. And I had a Brooklyn Arts Council grant, so my focus was um, gardens in the borough of Brooklyn. And um, I interviewed over 60 community gardeners from uh, 13 community gardens, uh, as you can see in, in the um, Google map. Um, and then the, the following year in 2022, I did a, um, I organized a public art installation, which was sign-based. Um, I worked with an awesome graphic designer, Ashley Snesdog Velez. Um, who designed these and each garden had a unique question that was inspired by my conversations with the gardeners. And then the QR code um, linked to audio collages where I used clips from the interview to think through and try to sort of answer for myself um, the questions on the signs. And um, I had two goals for the project. The first was uh, passersby um, who live in the neighborhood could think with us um, in these conversations, in these questions, and also listen in on the conversations that I was having with gardeners. And then the second goal was to um, bring more attention to these green spaces um, that, you know, if you're not a part of the community garden in your neighborhood, you might not notice it, like myself, um, who has walked by countless community gardens and didn't really notice them until I started working on this project. Um, so bringing more attention and awareness to these really vital green spaces as our um, communities and landscapes and neighborhoods are changing because of the climate crisis also felt really important. And can you talk, that's really interesting, um, and especially you know, to, to know that you went to all these different community gardens across the, uh, Brook, the borough of Brooklyn. Can you give some sense about as you, your first impressions, right? You said you didn't know too much, you'd walk by the community gardens, you know, they were there, but you didn't, you know, I suspect many New Yorkers the same way too. They see them, they're not sure, they go in, you know, what's there. What was your first impression um, as you walked into them? Um, you know, especially compared to now, given your incredible project, all the observations and conclusions that you've drawn, what were your first impressions like? And how was it different for the different community gardens and neighborhoods that you were visiting? Well, that's a good question because I started walking into community gardens. I mean, I'm embarrassed. I'm talking to a group of community gardeners um, 
somebody who's been gardening for decades. And um, I went into my first community garden in 2001 when I was doing this project. Um, I came to community gardens because I wanted to do another round of interviews. I had this grant and was looking for sort of partnership organizations. And I thought that community gardens were um, spaces in Brooklyn where I was able to talk to a lot of different kinds of people. And, and honestly, I feel like, at least in my experience of living in Brooklyn, community gardens feel like the most diverse and integrated spaces um, in Brooklyn. Uh, so that's how I chose community gardens. And I learned a lot about community gardens and gardening and how important it is um, as we face the climate crisis. But my first reaction was walking in was like, these are secret gardens of enchantment. I, every single garden I walked into was like a space of beauty and um, respite and magic. And I would come to a garden and it like had a fence this big. And I was like, oh, it looks messy in here. And I'd open it up and it was like, birds and flowers and plants and people. Um, the spaces are, are magical. That was my first impression of, of really all of, all of the gardens. Um, but it, each garden has their own like style and sort of flavor sounds stupid, but like each garden is really different and each garden is run by different people in different ways and uh, their focuses are different. Um, so that was also really interesting to see how individual each garden is based on the people who are gardening in the space and making choices about the space. And Jackson and Reagan, I'm curious to hear from you both too, given that perspective from Rachel, every garden is different. Um, its history is unique and different too. So just curious to hear a bit about from your perspectives, you know, some sense, we got a good soundtrack here too. Check, my check. Hello. All right. Um, so La Plaza Cultural got to start. So it's in Alphabet City. Um, so in the 70s and 80s, it was a very poor neighborhood. Um, and so uh, almost all the gardens there began as vacant lots where buildings burned down and collapsed. Um, so like one thing I like to keep in mind is that like often the garden space actually reflects a failure of city planning or it's like not a planned intended space. So they often exist in some of like what may formerly have been the poorest communities or the poorest sections. Um, and then it was cleaned up by the neighborhood and you know, the rest is history. So it's purely community effort, purely community planned. Um, and yeah, like I said, a start out is just like a vacant lot. And over time, it's just been landscaped and planted and developed more and more. Um, and that history, that's just like tip of the iceberg. It could certainly go on for probably an hour. Um, and as far as like climate resiliency stuff, just so many things yet, yeah, I don't know what's going to go up behind me, but this is like a flood map of the neighborhood. And the, here's a map of the garden we've made to, to this, um, solar panel construction project that is going to be a big focus of what's in this, um, PowerPoint. So this is a huge part of the resiliency project we're working on, which is this solar structure, um, and something interesting about this is that it's going to supply us with more than our power needs, essentially. So we'll have like an excess supply of power. Um, and a big reason for that is that like the idea here is that, you know, we this garden exists in a very flood risk, very like at risk climate zone. Um, during Sandy, there was power loss throughout the whole neighborhood and people were like just charging their phones at solar panels and community gardens. And so like part of the reason we got grant money approval for the structure is the idea that it will be like a resiliency 
project and something that could support the community in the event of power loss. Like keep that's very interesting. So it, it's where is it? Where's the project now? Is it already so it's been funded? Construction has been going on. What what is it? Oh, it's, it it's like? been a Sisyphean uh, task. <laughs> I've been working on it for like six years. Um, we're actually just about done with our final round of funding, um, and we're like about to have the solar panels installed. Hopefully in the next like two months. But it's been very very long and ongoing, and you can probably see from all the various paperwork and red tape. There's a lot of red tape. Um, yeah, because all the everything in the city is like we need to get a permit for this and every all the permitting structures are set up to permit like skyscrapers. And so they're like, what is this dinky little like what it's uh, like they don't there's no real mechanism to permit something that isn't like a commercial real estate project. And so then the extra energy that you all have could be used to help power the rest of the neighborhood, right? Yep. And then uh, we also do a ton of events. And so we like constantly have, uh, you know, the desire for electricity from people running events. So we want to be able to provide a stable power source for them. Which is, I think, incredible. Um, you know, I remember going out with um, the Parks Department to visit different um, community gardens and, and parks and playgrounds in our city. And I saw a couple out there, same way that have been, you know, capturing solar energy for use later. And I feel like what's great about that is one, of course, most importantly, helping the neighborhood, um, especially if there is some sort of power outage too, or that's needed. But also, as I mentioned before, with community gardens being su such grassroots efforts, you know, from my days before being in the city council, when I used to work on a small plaza, we had diversity plaza in our neighborhood in Jackson Heights. One of the hardest things was to find even the basic logistical things like a power source, electricity for our events, you're programming these public spaces. Um, and city government oftentimes doesn't provide those things or makes it very difficult to get them. And you all are stepping in yeah. and really playing that role for the community. And it's like the, if you can't provide electricity, there's like a whole class of event you just can never do, right? Exactly. And it's like, and if, if someone's like playing a music show and you're like, well, we don't know if the power will work that day. It's like, you know, it's not good. <laughs> Absolutely. And Ray, how about you? Let's hear a little bit about the history of, of your garden um, on Halsey Street. And also just, you know, what, what all are you all doing to, to make sure that it's working to, or what kind of climate, um, you know, um, protective strategies are you guys using as part of the garden too? Yeah, um, so our garden, 462 Halsey, it started in 2012. So it's a pretty new garden space in, within Bed-Stuy. Like there's kind of a legacy big garden over at Herbert Von King Park, uh, the Hattie Carthen Garden, which is everybody in the neighborhood knows about. It's like the size of a small city block. And uh, our garden is more the size of a brownstone. And so I, I think it's a, a nice, it's a nice parallel with what Jackson was just talking about, where you have this capacity to maybe provide power in a disaster where we are kind of like nestled in between two buildings and, and working at a smaller capacity, but trying to do similar and uh, yeah, similar work. Um, we have solar panels on site that provide most of the power that we need to do garden tasks and like operate tools and like electrical appliances. Like, I, I don't I don't know, I don't think we could like supply like a building size power, but uh, it, it provides power for the pump. Um, we have rainwater harvesting. Uh, we use a lot of mulch. Like a lot of our climate solutions are as low tech as possible. Um, to try and like provide a wider base of resiliency. Um, one thing that the city is doing is they are installing an on-site like water faucet within the next year. And so we're really excited for that to happen. Um, so we don't have to tap the fire hydrant anymore. Um, the garden members over there, like <laughs> the, the fire hydrant is like our bear. Um, um, but like a lot of our strategies around trying to use the garden as a, an organizing space within like the worsening climate crisis have to do with being a space of organizing, being a space of education, of, of learning, um, kind of just also like a space of beauty. Um, it's so small that you could walk past it. And if you don't look to the right, like within 20 seconds, you're on to the bodega and, and you don't know it's there, but uh, whenever we're there working, it's it's always such a lovely experience to have the gate open and have people walk by 
and kind of poke their heads in or like come in and have their breakfast there and, and have that experience of kind of discovering like like what Rachel said, like this kind of oasis in a place that you might not expect it. That's really interesting to hear. Um, and have you seen over time that, you know, um, there've been more and more volunteers that have been joining, um, that have been getting involved with the garden too? What's been the experience there? Yeah, so as I said before, like I'm in my third season at the garden and we we underwent a leadership transition last year. So we've, we've seen a lot of change since uh, there's been a change in leadership. But with that, there's, there's always an influx of new members and uh, people who are interested, who, who like email us, who like come by the garden on our work days. Um, sometimes it's overwhelming because everybody shows up at once and they all want like a, like a shovel or something, something to do right there in the moment. Um, but I, I think that there, there's a real parallel between kind of like changes within the community. I mean, bed is undergoing like pretty like rapid and, and like violent gentrification in a lot of ways. And so um, that, that's also reflected in turnover in the garden. And one thing that we do have is like a core of members who've been there from the start who have their own personal plots um, in our, so our garden is actually a community farm. And so most of it is all communally uh, sustained and, and managed, but then there are a few personal plots that the garden elders who voted to maintain their plots when the transition happened, they, they still maintain that. And so we do everything we can to like support them in what they need and like events that they want to throw. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's kind of a real juggling act of trying to manage even such a small space. So interesting is that I did notice before that it's that community farm over there too. So that's really great. Has it always been that way? And, and what kinds of things are you growing there as part of the, as, as, as a community farm? Um, it hasn't always been that way. At one point in time, it was a more traditional community garden where like people had their individual boxes. Um, I don't remember if I sent a picture of, of like what the plots look like, but there are six uh, compost diversity. Okay, there we go. So you can see there are like these six long beds. And so when the garden was transitioned from being uh, like a community garden to the farm, they got rid of the individual plots and created these like, essentially it's like 18 separate growing boxes. And so for those growing boxes, everything is for community members, for the community like that can come in when the garden is open and we've had uh, like produce bags or like little, like kind of like a mini CSA paper bag. Is that drip thing. hose irrigation I see? That is drip hose, yeah. So we have, we have drip irrigation. Um, we're trying to like really thickly mulch it because last year it was hot and it didn't rain very much. So we're trying to, even, even with the new like water infrastructure, figure out how we can just use less water. Um, but yeah, the transition to the community farm was actually about serving the community beyond just the people who work in the farm. So like during the pandemic, some community space was transitioned to more growing space. Like there used to be a big grassy kind of knoll in the back and now that's the garlic plot. <laughs> and, and so like, yeah, like in, 20, in 2020, the garden, I call it garden, but the farm, the farm garden, it like kind of went into a little bit more of a, a food production mode because the events couldn't happen. And so now we're like at the back end of that, trying to figure out how to like reincorporate the events that used to happen today. Very interesting and really interesting to see how it's evolved over time to, you know, as you mentioned, also give back or sustain the community too, beyond those who are just, you know, at the, at the garden of the farm itself. Um, you know, and one thing you mentioned, and, and Jackson, I'd love to hear a bit from, from you too about this, was the new water source coming in from the Parks Department, which raises a larger question about, you know, how can our city government uh, do more to support your work um, as community gardeners, um, you know, in these community efforts? I feel like as I mentioned before, in my some of my own community activism, 
over the years um, with the small public plaza, we always used to be fighting and you know putting pressure on the city to give more resources for our plaza because we were all volunteers. We couldn't sustain it ourselves too. So what kind of challenges do you see um, in, in, in maintaining the garden uh, where city government could step in and do a better job of eliminating bureaucracy or doing more to support you? <laughs> um, I put you on the spot, but <laughs> Anthony, first of all, I just want to say, you know, regardless of how you feel with him, thank you to Chuck Schumer because he is responsible for getting that money um, for that water for the gardens. It's a huge deal. It's a ton of money, and they're going to put water in a ton of gardens. It's amazing. Um, and to me, the biggest thing that the city can do really is like essentially like bureaucratic. You know, it's like protecting us from liability, shielding us from any development interest. And I would say right now that we are very appreciative of the ten-year license agreement that we just signed. Like stuff like that is really helpful. Just like providing that stability of just like you know, like to me, that's like their core function is just to like let us garden <laughs> and let us not worry about like the the bureaucracy and and like the minutia of like how do we defend our space. And like, how do we represent ourselves within the city? Uh, because like, those are very exhausting things and they're hard to do as a small organization too, you know? And it's like, especially when you're all volunteers, nobody wants to do that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, how about you, Ray? What, what would you say from your experience? What could city government do better to support you all? I mean, everything that Jackson just said. <laughs> um, I think like one thing that we kind of struggled with in the leadership transition was figuring out like the liability issue and like, when 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 to open up the garden to the public like when is it ready and like who's responsible for these things as there's not there there's a lot of different if you talk to different gardens everybody has a different opinion about about when you when you should do that so i, I think um that that's a big thing um you know it's a, more funding just some, if you yeah. don't know too like when you sign a liability form an individual has to sign it and so like often that individual is very like am i personally liable for the guard like it creates a lot of anxiety within the membership it has never once been an issue in my whole experience gardening but like just like the thought of it freaks people out big time yeah hey, that, that, that is a big thing and I, I will say as a lawyer a civil rights lawyer for many years before being going to you know politics liability is definitely a, a scary thing um and it is a big thing if you're trying to you know, manages public spaces. I, I saw it, um, you know, with the Department of Transportation when it came to our um, uh, diversity plaza that we had. And then just recently at our parks hearing, um, Commissioner Donahue and I were speaking about that during uh, the hearing itself, uh, because we have a program in the council called the Parks Equity Initiative, um, which we've increased funding for last year too, um, where small organizations can program our parks. But one of the biggest obstacles for, you know, small organizations to do that is one, um, the liability and insurance that come with it, right? And so you're kind of already limiting who can participate because your ability to do so really depends on you being able to sign these forms, put up the insurance. Um, and those are things that, you know, I remember in, uh, in, in my public space days too, and, you know, with my lawyer hat on as well, I would say, this is very difficult to ask volunteers to do. And something the city should really do more um, to step up on as well. And I know that, um, you know, the Parks Department has been very open to looking at what other agencies are doing in this area. Um, and so is the council as well to really say, how can we reduce these barriers to participation for, for small organizations and volunteers? One quick piece of advice too, is that if you ever have an issue with this, just remember that the city has way more money than you do almost certainly. And if someone's gonna make a, a lawsuit, they're gonna go after the people with money. And like, I'm totally seriously, like, this is like how we navigate this issue like within the garden. It's like, it could happen, but like if someone is like seeking like a fiscal, you know, like compensation for something, they are very unlikely to pursue an individual. They're gonna go for an organization. A absolutely true. Although, but at the same time, the principle is, is real though right it's like these are public spaces if we want to protect them as public spaces um and have people be a, and participate in those then they shouldn't have to worry about things the public entities should take on you know the risks or the 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 liabilities or whatever or insurance of those public spaces that's how we keep them public um and make sure they don't become privatized in my opinion at least um but rachel i wanted to turn it over to you we've heard some you know perspective now um from both jackson and ray about their gardens their histories You've been all over Brooklyn and seen all of them. Um, and I'm just curious to hear more about, you know, what um, what your observations were. How, what was the role overall? How did you see the community gardens in, in practice? 
helping to make the city more resilient or at least Brooklyn more resilient. Um, and then what did you see as differences? I, I, I have to imagine given the way the neighborhoods have changed, um, especially in Brooklyn neighborhoods too, what, has, what did you notice about how that affected the history of the garden or its role in the community? I'd love to hear your perspective. Um, so I prepared some audio clips. Is this a good time to play? It? Sure. Okay, great. Yep. Um, so I will say that, um, sorry, I just got a, a brain fart. Um, okay, so, um, so I, like I said before, I'm not a gardener. Um, I hadn't set foot into community gardens really until I started this project. And um, it was really the gardeners who were teaching me that as, as all of three of you are talking about, um, that these community gardens are really like our spaces for resilience in, in New York City um, as the conditions change because of climate change as things get tougher. Um, I mean, Jackson, hearing you talk about the solar panels and providing um, energy and also Ray, I talked to a gardener at 462 Halsey who talked about how, I don't know if you're still doing it, but she was talking about how um, at the time that I was interviewing her, that the, the farm is focusing on like the most nutrient dense kinds of foods to be growing so that like you can most effectively feed the community, um, which feels like some really deep resiliency work. Um, so I, and, and the other thing that struck me was that gardens and um, what you as gardeners do, um, how you pay attention to uh, nature and the land and how you interact with each other in these, you know, democratic spaces, um, are, they, they form a really useful framework for everybody um, to think about um, what our values, how our values, how our social structures, how the way that we are in our spaces need to change um, as we face the oncoming climate crisis. So I put together sort of five lessons that I learned that um, with clips that for me feel like um, useful ways for me as somebody who's not a gardener uh, to take those lessons and frame like how I think about how I move forward in the world um, as I'm thinking about how, how do we live in a changing landscape. Um, so let me see where they are, here they are. So um, the first lesson uh, that I learned is how close um, gardeners pay attention to um, the world around them and how important paying attention is um, for all of us as we move forward um, in inside of change. So this is a clip. It's a cutting of a plant. It's a seed. All you have to do is, all you need is two things, the, the thing and time and, um, and patience. So it's three things. Um, if you're not patient enough, you can think something is dead, but then it's not, you know, it's like if you hang on, it's like it's going to sprout or it'll actually sprout out roots. Um, or, or, you know, things can go great. They can go wrong too, but you know, it's like, just pay attention, watch, wait, see what happens kind of thing. I feel like it's easier to get caught up in like bills and like money. And I feel like that, that could become your life. I feel like I was on my way to that. And then just getting into this with farming, it was like, I'm more connected to people. Now I got more connected to plants. And it's just like, there's other life out there. It's not just stress and panic and get it how you live it. And like, everything's a struggle. It's like, you can take it slow and still have joy in life and find some really little things to like keep you going. I don't know. It just made me calm down and slow down. Um, and I will also say that I'm really interested in this sort of wonky moment in our history as humans where we're um, sort of straddling like the comforts of modernity um, with um, those, the, with sort of this idea of continuity is kind of crumbling around us um, with the climate changing. Um, and so a big question we for me, like, you know, um, how do we fully, live in 
a world of change? How do we see change rather than see um, the world that we always thought that we were living in? How do we see the real world that we're actually living in? I think that's a process for everybody. So paying attention for me um, is a way of, of doing that and processing. Um, so the other thing, because gardeners are no, so paying attention, um, a lot of people have been noticing changes in local landscapes way before I think a lot of other people who are not as tuned in to the natural world have been. I think a lot of people maybe in the past 10 years, five, 10 years are like, whoa, things are not what they used to be. But I think gardeners have been knowing that there's been change and it's been getting warmer for a lot longer. When I first joined this garden, Catherine Oreck, who is my mentor here, said, well, we're going up to zone seven because I was like, I have these penstemon, I'm growing them on the roof. They shouldn't, penstemon society didn't believe me because they're all out in Arizona and New Mexico and whatnot. I was like, look, they're growing. <laughs> I took photographs. This was 22 years ago. Yeah. And uh, I brought them into the garden. And um, everyone said, oh, they're not going to grow. They're not going to grow. Well, Pennsylvania, some, a lot of Pennsylvania aren't long lived, but they all live. So I was like, I have a rock garden over there that defied. I had things that were only from California. I bought from Siskiyou Rare Plant Nursery. I bought from California uh, rock garden nurseries. Everyone said it's not going to last, not going to last. Totally fine. What made you think that they would grow? Because I knew it was hotter. You could feel. I'm a farmer, so you know when things. I should go back to the original. If it's not getting cold, cold in winter. I had tomatoes December 18th. That's not normal. This is 22 years ago. And then the next lesson is um, gardeners are already practicing adaptation. When I first joined this. What are you gonna do? <laughs> How are you gonna grow? Well, what we're doing is we're observing and keeping track of what we're observing so that next year we know what to expect and to cope with it better because there's nothing else we can do but to try to adapt to the changes as they come. What, what's the what's the value of learning how to grow things and taking care of the, things? The, the epidemic we just started, you know, so you never saw so many backyard gardens in your life. What's that about? What's that about? Yeah. It's about survival and learning how to do what your ancestors did long before you could walk to the corner and get it from the grocery store. Being self-sustainable, being able to take care of yourself and your family, just in case something happens that you can't. There are no, there's nothing on the shelf in the grocery store. Learn seed saving. That way you can start your little, you know, little patch ready. You can grow food anyway. What we have done is um, make sure we harvest the seeds, right? And we make sure and dry it out and we replant it next year in hopes that it will be better and stronger. Um, and the fourth lesson, uh, which you're all talking about today is um, that, what is the fourth lesson? Oh, <laughs> um, that gardeners offer, gardens offer solutions for- What are you gonna do? worsening effects of, of climate crisis and also just of, for, you know, history of, of pollution in the city. Well, I, I have a history of suffering from asthma and I noticed when I started volunteering with Papa Jones, I didn't need my inhaler. Wow. And I mean, this is the most labor intensive work I've ever done in my life. I believe in the future, those people that are gardening are going to be the safeguard of those that live in the earth because we will continue yeah. that agriculture. We will continue to produce. So those people that don't have will yeah. have. Urban farms are going to be so much more important in the future because we're cast into a city sewage system and that's huge. So like when it rained eight inches two weeks in a row or two weeks apart with Hurricane Henry and Hurricane Ida. 
like that eight inches of rainwater flooded farms upstate and it didn't flood us because like anything that can't be contained by our plants runs into the sewage system. And then um, the fifth lesson that I'm highlighting today, there was a lot of lessons, but um, the fifth lesson is just that with a problem like climate crisis, it's so big. And I think it really, you can feel so paralyzed. And like this question of like, what can I do? I think it's looming on most people. Um, and I think gardens really offer ways uh, to engage um, civically and, um, uh, and, and taking actions in, in this moment where the problem feels intractable. It's, it's giving you like material ways to actually work on um, the, the issue in your own community. There is scarcity in this world, but like I think plants can really get you out of that mentality where it's like, you know, scarcity exists, but also like if you're willing to like put love and attention to things, and I think love is about attention. It's about like saying, what does this person need? What does this plant need? Like what is a conducive growing environment? Um, you know, like love is a really good counterbalance to scarcity. There isn't much that I can do about it as a individual, but working as a group, uh, say with this garden and the way that we grow uh, food, the way that we handle uh, our waste products, the plastic, the recycling, the composting, all that sort of thing. We try, try to do my part that way. So. What makes me just like, smile so much is when I see kids like their eyes wide wide open and they're, they're they're seeing what we're doing and they're getting into it and you know they're, they're going to have that that connection to their their food and their their impact in the world and their connection to everyone else planted really early the community gardens across the city mm -hmm. I think serves an important role in educating people who live in New York City about nature, ecology, life cycles. Um, and that in itself, you know, is not like, you know, a direct climate change, um, you know, like action point necessarily, but I think it brings awareness to uh, sort of the natural ecosystem that you might not be, have a chance to be aware of living in an urban environment. Thank you um, for those clips, Rich. I mean, I think that the lessons you learned, um, you're right, are really powerful for not just the community gardeners themselves, but for all of us as communities and thinking about from the climate crisis to the last point in particular, you mentioned about the ways that these are organizing spaces and bring people together around activism. Um, I wanted to stay on that for a minute too. And just, you know, taking a step back, we've talked a lot about ways in which community gardens um, are crucial for the fight against climate change. But that last point I think is so important too is, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the panel as well, we in the city are facing so many different crises right now, right? From whether it's our climate, public health, um, housing and gentrification, um, to uh, public safety and how we think about that and what it means um, to keep ourselves safe. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to, before turning to questions, open it up to you all to talk a bit about the role that community gardens can play in bringing people together around those issues. I think both of you, um, Ray and Jack, has identified community gardens and neighborhoods that have experienced a lot of change and gentrification over time too. Neighborhoods that, you know, in addition to may not, ha may not having a lot of green space, may have had issues with fresh food access as well. Um, and these larger themes of racial justice that we that we think about and talk about. So how have your community gardens played a role in bringing people together to organize around those issues? I know, Ray, with, with the Halsey Street Garden too, I think you all have had education or reading uh, events there too. Um, and so when these larger fights that we face and crises we face in our city, how has the garden been a place for, for organizing for, for each of your communities? We will start with you, Jackson. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> oh, I could name the ways. Um, we do tons of stuff. I mean, for me, it's uh, big that we're like a demonstrative space where we're like demonstrating a lot of things that, you know, 
a lot of people maybe aren't exposed to in New York, like composting and just like various gardening techniques. Um, it's just like we get so much foot traffic over here in Manhattan. So like, so if we, you know, build some sort of sustainable thing or like piece of infrastructure, it's like the exposure that it will get is like very, very high. Um, and I also just think like the community aspect is so critical too. just like, you know, having people you can like rely on. And it's like, as climate change advances, things will only become more uncertain. And I think like in New York, especially there are a lot of like, I would say like non-atomic family arrangements where people need close friendships and close bonds or whatever to, to, to weather them. And so I think that to me, it's just like, again, like the demonstration and just like, to me, the biggest part though is just community. It's just like truly just like bonds you form with the people around you. Yeah, kind of building off of that, I like when you look at a map of community gardens, there are these like dots interspersed and like sometimes they're clustered and sometimes they're like pretty disparate and like it kind of looks like a bunch of islands in the city, like in the city that is like, you know, famously an island. <laughs> and I, I think that like the it's more than that, like they look like islands, but like we're not going to address or solve any of these issues if we're all separate. And so I think the community that we can build like within gardens and between gardens and also just like within community, like gardens are not separate from the communities they're in. They are an extension of them. And I, I think that like from our educational programming or like the food we grow or even just the kind of like happenstance interactions that are fostered by having a bench in front of, like a, a public bench on a sidewalk in front of our garden. Um, like we can we can do a little bit, uh, but I, I don't, I think the, the question about like what can gardens, how can they be at the forefront of kind of addressing the climate crisis, I think, uh, I don't think they can be. <laughs> I, I think like we need legislation and that like that is one kind of space that gardens can provide is like, like you said, like an organizing space because like just as gardens aren't islands from each other, they're also part of the city. And like if the city and the state and the country don't pass climate legislation for like mitigation and adaptation, that there's only like so much that we can do. Sure, sure. Well, also, I think one point you mentioned that was great um, was just that they're not extensions of the neighbor. They're, they're part of the community, right? And I think in that sense, that's how we think about our, our green spaces generally, whether it's our parks, um, gardens, or um, plazas too, is that there are places to come together to organize in one way or another, right? That we have to see our public spaces that way and really treat them that way so that people can come spend time together, uh, both to restore themselves, uh, but also to, to, to recommit um, to the work too. So, you know, I know that was a really important point that you hit. And as we're opening it up now to questions um, from the audience as well, um, Rachel, I just thought, you know, before we go to that, you could talk a little bit about, thank you. What do you see as the future for community gardens in the city? You know, you've done so much work studying and analyzing their importance. Um, what are some of the future challenges you see with, with community gardens or future roles they can play? Um, how do things look on that front? Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't think I can answer that question. I certainly can't answer it as well as Ray or Jackson can. I open it up to you guys. Anything, what do you, what do you all think? It's like about the, you just like yeah. replay Sure, the what's the, the future holds for community gardens in terms of yeah. what are the challenges that you might see coming up that we've got to, you know, grapple with um, to support community gardens or what role they can play um, going forward um, in, in the future of our city too. Yeah, definitely. Um, I get like, uh, I think a huge service we provide something that's really important too is like, um, like local event space for just like very small events, like local community birthday parties, local, whatever, uh, uh, weddings, stuff like that, where like, it's, it's especially like where we, where we're located in Manhattan, it's like real estate's so expensive, venue space is so expensive. It's like with the increasing like wealth disparity, we are like one of the very few venues where like someone can be like, hey, like I have $20, I wanna have a kid's birthday party. 
and like we can provide them an outdoor space for that. And like, you know, I think what you were saying about like, we can't solve the climate crisis is like spot on. Like we can't do it like in the community garden. Like all we can do is support our community and like enrich the lives of the people that live around it as much as we can. Um, um, and, and you asked like, what are some of the challenges? Like what Jackson was saying, like, I think like property, property is really valuable here. And I've been part of gardens in other cities where they got developed. And, and I think like, you know, finding ways to protect these public spaces, like as far into the future as we can is like pretty important now because you never know which way like political or like developmental winds will turn. And um, like these spaces, they offer an interface for people to have a connection with plants and insects and animals and like a little bit of like maybe their own space as it's like increasingly being crowded out. And I, and I don't think that can be like, the value of that can't be overstated. I completely agree. And I think it's very easy also to like look at a community garden space, especially like from a removed position and say like, what an unutilized, like until very recently, they were all classified as vacant lots. Like every single parcel of land that was a community garden, if you looked it up in like the city system of classification, it would say, this is a vacant lot owned by the parks department. That's unbelievable. Like literally until maybe like three years ago. And so like that was sort of how the city was treating the valuation of that land. And like, I can also tell you that like, I have on the dotted line signed for some permits for the garden and within weeks received calls from developers that were like, hey, do you own this piece of land and can we buy it from you? <laughs> and I of course laughed in their face <laughs> and was like, clearly you did not do your research and do not understand what this land actually is. But I'm saying like the appetite is there and it's like, you know, thank you to Green Thumb for keeping those people away from us. <laughs> It's shocking, and but also it kind of goes to what we were talking about before, right? When you have these larger crises we face, and you have developers looking for any opportunity they can to speculate, to uh, you know, build luxury housing, and they to to see that you know they were classified. And I do remember this as vacant lots. Um, kind of also just shows how a city needs to you know hasn't prioritized enough public open space um, as the valuable you know um, spaces that they are, and instead treats them as you know, spaces or lots that, are, that developers then seize on. So part of it is really changing our perspective and our mind frame too. Um, now, one of the questions we had from, from the audience was uh, maybe Ray, you talked a bit about, you know, composting um, in your garden. Maybe we can start with you on this one is what feedback do you have on the city's composting efforts um, as a community gardener? Um, a lot, a lot there. <laughs> I'm, I mean, so I live in Brooklyn and so, like Queens has had a composting program longer than the rest of the city, like recently. Um, we just got these like orange boxes that have started popping up that you need to scan with your phone. And um, I, I mean, I still encourage people to bring their compost to us because like, I, th I think as much as you can kind of like recycle like nutrients within the community you live like I always say and, and this isn't like original to me but like we're not really growing vegetables we're building soil and so like if we just focus on how much we can grow then we might lose sight of the fact that we need to like support this entire ecosystem to make that possible and so like, I think it's really, well, one, I think it's really positive that the city is trying to implement a composting collection system because it, it's like far past due, like Seattle and, and like a lot of West Coast cities have had compost collection for over a decade now. And um, yeah, it just goes to landfill. So I, I think it's good. I don't know if I answered the question. But um, no, and I think one thing you mentioned, which I think is right, is that, you know, yes, we in Queens have had composting, but also it's with fits and starts. It started, then it was pulled back to make way for a citywide one. I know that's something that um, Councilmember Sandy Nurse, who's chair of sanitation, and I have spoken a lot about too, is, you know, why, why was that the case? And why did you pull back the Queens residents for start, starting to get used to composting and it was pulled back as well? So some of it is the community gardens play a role, I think, that the city, while the city figures itself out um, and needs to do more to really support composting, make it mandatory, make it universal, the community gardens are providing a year-round a year sustainable place to do it. 
um, when the wheels of government turn really slow, or at least more so than than oh, city, yeah. more more reliable than 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 the uh, uh, city's composting practices are at this point. Um, Jackson, how about this one? How is your garden reaching out to non-members of the garden to teach or create awareness of sustainable garden practices? Yeah, um, we have a wide variety of like workshops and classes and stuff that are pretty much entirely open to the public. Um, we don't necessarily do a lot of like outreach necessarily that's like aimed at like non-members. We have a, a, a week or we have a newsletter that goes out um, to anyone who signs up for it. Um, but like, we don't really have like the capacity to do sort of like outreach beyond that. But I mean, like we do like herbalism classes, there've been bike repair workshops that have happened there. I mean, very, very few things that happen in the garden are like gated and restricted in any way to who's there. Um, and like I said, to me, it also is just like demonstrative, like people have never seen a bumblebee before. Like I've literally seen that interaction happen. So like, just like the exposure is like, I think a huge factor. And Jackson, just staying on, on you too, for another question was when you talked about um, the solar energy, the solar panels before and the storage of energy, where will the batteries be stored and, and who will maintain them? Yeah. Um, so we've actually worked with this company who's been really great called uh, Pavilion. They don't have an I after, between the P and the V. That's how you spell their name. Um, but they will be providing the batteries. Actually, great question. Uh, specifying the battery storage was like an explicit part of the um permit for this because of the flood risk and so like we have to essentially the battery is going to be in like an elevated housing that will sit like three feet above the ground to make sure that it's not inundated with flood water and explode um it also weighs like i want to say 600 pounds it's very heavy and so you know hopefully that will prevent it from being stolen but it's going to be in like a locked box that's like bolted to a cement foot <laughs> footing um uh but yeah so we actually very well. That was a very well thought out thing. And like I said, great question, because it is like a very specific issue. And that was, like I said, was the one thing the city was like, you have to tell us exactly where the battery will, battery will be. It has to be up high. <laughs> it sounds like it's, it's secure, but very good question, because you're right. I think these efforts, you know, we have to think about ways as, as, as volunteers, as, as gardeners, that we can keep these things going. And sometimes even the most basic questions or basic maintenance issues um, are things that need to be thought through very carefully, too. Um, and then the final question really open it up to, to all of you, um, I think it's a good one to, really, to, to close on is community gardens have led the way on integrating sustainable practices into citywide initiatives like composting, like we just talked about. Um, for any of you all, what are models in community gardens that you'd like to see the city take on next? I, I mean, the, I was thinking about this with the past question kind of after, I, after I, my brain kept turning after I finish talking. And I think that one thing that community gardens can offer for this, like, like maybe like model of resiliency is, is actually that like they are connected via green thumb and via parks, but they're decentralized. And I think that like a, a lot of conversation about how we can build our city and society to be more resilient in, within like climate change is by like empowering ourselves and each other to operate in like a connected but decentralized way. And that like, you know, you said you were sad that Queens ended its compost program to become part of the citywide thing. And, and I think that's fair because like, I think, I think that like, it's possible that like, we're stronger together, like if everything isn't the same everywhere. And that like, you know, each borough is different, each environment within different neighborhoods and boroughs is different. And so like, I don't, I don't think there's a one, there's necessarily like a one size fit all solution that we can like say is gonna work from like the Bronx to Staten Island. And so I, I think like finding ways to support like financially and also like politically solutions that maybe work in Red Hook and it's okay if, it doesn't work in Crown Heights or in Harlem. It's very well said. Rachel, do you have any thought? I mean, you also saw that you got, you visited so many different neighborhoods to, to raise point in terms of every neighborhood has their own unique history, role of a community garden. Um, uh, and any thoughts uh, from you on, you know, what, what things community gardens uh, could be involved with 
what models might be possible from what you've seen that could lead the way in, for the future of the city too? I mean, I don't have anything specific because you know I, I really am not intimately involved in any of these spaces, but I would just say, you know, politicians, legislatures, people who are running the city should be listening to gardeners, um, should be listening to gardeners. Well said. How about you, Jackson? Yeah, um, one thing that's really big for me in the garden that actually drew me to it in the first place is that it's like a unmonetized space that exists in like in New York, which is like such a heavily monetized place where like very, there are very few places you can go where your time isn't kind of being monitored. And you know, they're not like, hey, you know, you finished that plate, you should probably leave pretty soon. Um, and like that like unstructuredness to it, I feel like is so healthy for me and just for like humans in general. And like, I think it's so rare in the city. And like, I think there are many places where you would like struggle to reach, to find a place like that that's like nearby. And so I think like, to me, that is like, I wish there were more spaces like that in New York. I understand like, you know, <laughs> if wishes were fishes, but like, to me, that's just like, I don't know. That's like one of the most important parts of it for me. And I wish there was more of it. Very good point. Um, Rachel, did you have any other audio clips to, to play for us to, to close us out or? Yes, there is one more audio clip. I'm actually not sure which one Mara picked, um, but it's an audio clip. And and I'll also just say that the intro outro music that you hear is, is part of the audio collages. Um, most of the audio clips that I ended with in the collages are sort of more diegetic moments. I assume this is going to be one of them. Rainy, Rainy, ask your mom to save some of the seeds from this um, cucumber. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we can have it for next year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. save some of the seeds for next year. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to say to you all, and that was a great way to end. Um, thank you all for coming out to today's panel, too, for the whole conference, um, to, to Green Thumb and our Parks Department, too. Uh, I think what you heard today, the perspectives of gardeners who are doing the work every day, is certainly very helpful and impactful for me um, when I, I'm fighting on these issues on a larger policy level, legislative level, um, to know the impact of these green spaces. And we say it and we talk about it, but to know what they mean for communities across our city, their history, their different meaning, the roles they can play and bring people together from an organizing standpoint, humanizes in so many ways why it is so critical that these spaces are protected and supported, why we need to expand green spaces, whether it's gardens or parks um, in our city too, um, and how essential they are for our health and well-being as well. Um, and so uh, to each and every one of you, I want to say thank you for the work that you're doing every single day to care for our gardens, to document and tell the story of their importance and role in our city too, um, and to our parks department as well for being such strong supporters uh, of them and finding ways um, to make them more accessible for our community too. It's always work in progress, there's more to be done. But I do know um, that I've got a real partner in our parks department, and our parks commissioner, um, that's really committed to addressing these issues too. And we've got to keep pushing that forward and really kind of transforming our city government to focus on, on, on these things as priorities. Um, but I do know that we've got a lot of people who are passionate about that work um, from our communities to across city government um, in our city council and that we'll keep pushing forward on these issues as well. Um, so thank you all so much. Thanks for coming out today. And a big round of applause to our panelists. Thank you all so much.